the face of uh, international collaboration, we have another prestigious annual academic event, which is, which is International Igniting Mind Lecture Series 2020. Like we say, creativity uh, is a digital, uh, you know, daily task at Jagran School of Visual Arts and Design under the Faculty of Journalism and Creative Studies. Our school prioritizes the pursuit of bold vision of influencing and impacting how the world connects every day. Uh, one of the premier institutions in Central India, Jagran School of Visual Arts and Design, is completely devoted to practical and theoretical knowledge. Uh, of films, animation, aesthetic design, and innovation. Our school promotes collaboration across traditional boundaries uh, with a vision of global learning. With this thought today, I would like to introduce you all to our speaker guest, uh, Dr. Pillar. I would like to give, uh, give a uh, brief introduction about Dr. Pillar. Uh, Dr. Pillar lives between Milan, London, and Delhi since 10 years and she holds a PhD with honors in architectural composition from Politecnico de Milano in collaboration with the National uh, Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage in Delhi and Westminster University in London. She has been extensively studying the city of Delhi pre and post independence and in particular the impact of British and American cultures on its urban planning and architecture. She has been researching for European and cultural Indian cultures, development, cultural exchanges, and she has been exploring tradition, identity, heritage, and so many things. She is an associate professor in history and theory of architecture and human settlements at Indian Italian GD Goenka University, branch of uh, Politecnico, she is also an affiliated researcher at Ambedkar University and uh, an adjunct professor at, of history of architecture at Politecnico de Milano. She is also an author of books such as Maps of Delhi, Negotiating Cultures, Delhi Architecture and Planning. We welcome you, Dr. Pillar. Thank you so much for joining us today for the session. Now I would like you to take over the session and share your valuable insights. <laughs> Thank you very much, Akshata. It's It was a wonderful presentation and I'm very glad to be here today. And I think this terrible COVID situation have opened up certain possibilities of sharing knowledge across countries. So I'm very glad that I can do this from Italy and we can be all together today. Uh, Jagran Lake City University also, thank you very much to the whole institution for, um, I mean, sponsoring such a nice, uh, uh, such a nice initiative. So good afternoon to all. I can see that you are 40 people, so I'm quite uh, excited about this session. Uh, I am Pilar Guerrieri. I mean, Akshata had given already quite an extensive explanation of who I am. I just want to add a few personal um, hints of what I've been doing. I mean, I was trained as an architect and then uh, being extremely passionate about history of architecture and really wanting to go uh, and explore uh, Eastern uh, architecture. I met uh, Edi Krishna Menon, who was at that time the head of Intak Delhi chapter. And uh, through him, I started this PhD, this adventure on the history of Delhi architecture. And from there, I spent almost four years uh, studying and exploring the city of Delhi. And then they gave me this opportunity to teach in India. And I spent another four years uh, in Delhi teaching. And then I came back just recently to Italy. Uh, to teach again history and, and theory of architecture, but also, I mean, we'll discover today that history of architecture is also very much linked to uh, history of art and history of design. So the things are all connected. Um, so I spent uh, many years in your country and I'm completely in love with it. So uh, actually it's been one year that I couldn't travel to India and I'm really sad about it. So I'm very, very, so this is just to say that I'm very, very glad that there is this opportunity to be in touch, even if not physically, but at least uh, through the net. So today 
uh, the topic I was asked to speak about is quite broad, which is history of art and evolution of design. But I'll try to do my best uh, to try and, and uh, give, what, uh, give back what I am particularly passionate about, uh, art history and design history, to see if you could also be as inspired as I am about the topic. Uh, I would like to share my presentation, so I think if uh, Akshata could make me a presenter, I could uh, share yeah, it. You can share the presentation, I guess. I think I can. Uh, let me see. Yes. I think, uh, I hope you'll be able to see it. Yes, we can. Uh, do you? Yes. Excellent. So history of art and evolution of design. As I said, I am an historian of art architecture, but uh, history of architecture do go hand in hand with history of art and evolution of design. I have been teaching and I'm still in touch with Gidi Goenka University, which was a design school. So I have also been teaching history of art and history of design separately. But I think what is particularly interesting is to see the connections that are there between these uh, disciplines. So very broad, uh, very broad topic, which of course in uh, 45 minutes, one hour, I won't be able to uh, go through the whole history, but I just, as I said, give some hints of uh, what is particularly interesting and want to show you one particular moment of the history of art, design and architecture that has changed completely uh, its course. So I don't know how familiar you are with uh, history of art and design. I mean, I would like to know more about how much you know about history of art and, and design, but I will do that at the end of the class. So I'm gonna just ask you, what did you know about these things and how, uh, how much I've been able to add up on your knowledge. So there is one moment of history that has changed completely, history of art, design and architecture, that's why I've selected it. It's the 19th century. The 19th century is a period uh, extremely fascinating because uh, all three of these disciplines have modified themselves. So it is particularly important because the, um, the, the industrialization was invented. So before the 19th century, there was no industrialization. And the uh, industrialization, which is something that has relatively less to do with art, design and architecture, apparently, in reality has uh, been particularly affecting all of these disciplines. First thing I would like you to think about is that usually we think of art, design and architecture as disciplines that are separate from other things. I mean, we not very often we realize that uh, history of architecture, design and art go uh, hand in hand with uh, certain um, cultural and historical events. So what uh, is the first step is to first understand that uh, architecture, art and design are the mirror of other things. So are the mirror of uh, certain events that are, for example, historical or certain innovations that have absolutely nothing to do with those disciplines. And that is particularly the case of industrialization. Industrialization is something that uh, the industrial revolution have changed things definitely not um, uh, necessarily related to design and art and architecture, but indirectly had completely modified the world of that time. So let's see a few of things that for us are completely normal that have, cha have been changed uh, around that time. So first of all, um, there was the industrialization have changed the mass production, something that for us is uh, absolutely normal. So we think that, I don't know, if a vase is produced or a pen is produced, is mass produced produced. I mean, there's not one single artisan who's designing the pen, but there is an industrial uh, mechanism that creates from one pen another uh, thousands and thousands of pen. So this is something that we give it for granted, but at that time was absolutely not the case. There was one artisan that probably take one day to design one chair before industrialization. And immediately after industrialization, the chair was uh, not just one in one day, but maybe 10,000 in one day. So this, of course, you can imagine which kind of repercussion it had, which kind of consequences, because if you have 10,000 chair in one day, you probably can make the cost of the chair go much uh, less. 
So many more people could afford that chair. So that sort of creates a mechanism of change also very much connected with design. Uh, because of course a chair is a piece of design and so <laughs> if I, one chair is not designed by one artisan uh, but that chair is designed as a um, industrialized process you may have uh, 10,000 chairs available so the design of the uh, of the house's furniture may change uh, the, the the houses the shape of the interior of the houses may change and so on so this is just to give you one example, but there are many others. I mean, there was the invention of steel. Glass and steel were actually used in structures. So it was an invention in a material that then had huge consequences in buildings. For example, it was possible to build uh, very big structures. I mean, you, through steel and, and the adoption of steel, for example, in uh, reinforced concrete, allowed at that time to be uh, much larger spaces. So uh, through steel, you could be, uh, you could, uh, you didn't know, you didn't need um, any more uh, thick walls. Maybe you just need a um, few. Um, you could, you could design. You see now here from this image, you can build, for example, much larger spaces. So such an invention like steel changed completely the architecture of the places. And then there are, there are other inventions. For example, there were transportation systems that have changed very much. There was, for example, the invention of cars and train. So the train and cars made people move around the world much quicker. So what I would like you to think about is that in the 19th century, the world that have moved very slow up till the 19th century have uh, immediately changed and become much quicker uh, compared to the past. So certain changes that took maybe uh, 300 years, four, 500 years to happen in the past, immediately after the 19th century have become much faster. That's why uh, we, we saw from the 19th century up till today, huge amount of changes. And uh, somehow we have seen in 100 years what has happened in 1000 years before. So this change of the perception of time, uh, the change in terms of um, mass production, the change in design, in architecture, also in art. There was, for example, the invention of uh, certain paint that were not natural paint anymore, but with synthetic paint, which changed completely the way uh, to do uh, art. There was, for example, another invention in the 19th century that was photography, who put in complete crisis the world of art. And so an invention that was an invention like a, a machine, like a photograph um, machine has actually somehow modified also the way we have perceived art. So I must say that the 19th century is probably a crucial moment uh, of change. So now I would like to show you maybe very quickly, but there is one, uh, one video that uh, I hope that is here somewhere. Um, let me see. Um, one second. Um, doesn't matter. I'm going to show you it later. There is Charlie Chaplin who have done a fantastic video on uh, modern times. You may be able to check it yourself. It is a video that is fantastic because it's kind of showcasing the change that happened during this period. So the man that was completely absorbed by the machine and he did it as a comic uh, video, which has made the, 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 I mean, has made the history of this period of time. So modern times of Charlie Chaplin, you definitely should go and, and check it out. I, I'm gonna then type it in the in the in the in the chat afterwards. So um, different people. There was such a big revolution in so many fields that not everybody reacted positively to such a change. I mean, as as everything, when there's something new coming up, there are people who have who are in favor and other people who are against it. So, is there any of you could uh, uh, that could tell me which uh, do you think are the pros and the cons of um, industrialization in the in design, in design or in art? Would you be able to share uh, your thoughts with me? Is there anyone who can think of what? Uh, industrialization brought, uh, which could be the positive aspects of industrialization on design and which are the negative aspects of it? 
and um, yes. availability of different products to everyone okay and different that... types of products are available to everyone okay yes so, true everybody could afford it yes yes ma'am that is definitely a pro but who can uh, who can talk against against it who is there anyone who can suggest which are the cons of of it ma'am can i answer mm -hmm. yes ma'am the con which i see uh, industrialization had a huge impact on art okay. first of all uh, before industrialization people had a value of everything for example let's take an example of a chair only before okay. industrialization when a chair was built it was means people used to admire the chair the quality of the chair but after industrialization when they were built in huge amount in a lot of numbers people were just like it's very common for them but before in industrialization it was a huge invention for them yes so the quality the quality went down so uh, of course uh, there was a sort of also admiration that it took a long time to make the chair so the chair was somehow a piece of art somehow and instead when it had become mass produced that value of that chair have actually been lost mostly yes definitely is there anyone else who wants to say some pros and cons when we are getting more and more dependent on the materials and the things like we need assistance for it's just like we need assistance for almost everything now and uh, before industrialization we were more on the uh, human capabilities and uh, like exploring the uh, basic reason of being a human and just uh, exploring uh, the human qualities now we are more and more assisted by the machines the technology and uh, you know sort of thing yeah it's true uh, there was yes the machine is actually taking over human skills and also as you said you haven't said it uh, like in such term but what i i can i can see from your words is also that uh, human uh, an artisan and so on was much more self sufficient he could do uh, more things i mean he could uh, actually manages different aspects of the design uh, from the engineering point of view to the artistic point of view to the uh, material and sourcing the material point of view i mean it was much more a 360 degree figure while nowadays the discipline has been split in so many things that actually somebody who at that time maybe was an artist a designer and an architect all together nowadays we have three different figures we have one architect one designer and one um artist for example yes definitely a very good point anyone else who has some other um other comment on pros and cons of uh, industrialization mom due to increase of industrialization mom we started cutting trees so much that uh, now there is so much uh, pollution over there yes all pollution. over the world yes there was global warming greenhouse effect also yes of course because more more traveling more trains more airplanes more cars as a consequence extreme uh, problems in terms of pollution and uh, environment and so on yes definitely so this debate that we're having here it's something that has been really happening in the 19th century when I mean, there were two uh, groups of people there were a group of people who were actually believing that industrialization was a disaster and another group of people that instead thought that industrialization was a great opportunity so there is uh, one of the most interesting figures of those who believe that industrialization was a disaster was William Morris. He was an Englishman who designed this house who actually wrote a manifesto uh, saying very clearly that industrialization was bringing a sort of decay of artisanal work and so of art and architecture and design as pieces of art. So he started design this is a cover of his book and this is the house that he designed the red house which has become extremely famous as a manifesto of this um resistance that he had against industrialization so what he said is that actually uh, we have to fight industrialization because the real um interest the real skills are related to art and craft so art and craft are somehow something very uh, important and they do not Uh, have to um do not have to be lost so he made a huge campaign 
against uh, these industrialized process. And in fact, if you look at the house, it's a very traditional house. It's all made of bricks. Uh, the roof has to slope. There is the relationship with nature. You see little tiny uh, windows, like a very typical uh, traditional English house. And also you can see it also the traditional house in its manifesto and also in the plan. Because if you look at the plan of, plan of this house, the whole building is built with simple walls. So a wall structure, which was the uh, structure that since the Greek and Roman time was being used. And then there is another group of people who believed that uh, industrialization was an extremely good opportunity. So there were, were people who were seeing the opportunity of changing the life of people, of being a life changer um, tool. So they thought that everybody could afford uh, new uh, new furniture, uh, more people could uh, be uh, living in better houses. So one of these uh, is definitely Le Corbusier. Le Corbusier is probably the, the, the great master uh, that embraced industrialization at that time, and many others followed uh, him, Adolf Loos and uh, Gropius and many others, thinking that uh, industrialization could uh, give a small house, but a decent and um, incredibly efficient house to everyone. So Le Corbusier, for example, uh, here you can see, this is a, probably one of his houses that are a manifesto of his new vision, which clearly differentiates itself from the previous house. For example, in this case, we don't have walls, but we have piloti, so we have uh, um, pillars. And then we have a house that is extremely modern. In fact, uh, from industrialization, there was all the modern movement that began. In fact, uh, from the 19th century onwards, we, we, we speak about the modern age. And here we can see the roof, the ceiling, that is not anymore a typical traditional roof ceiling, but is a flat ceiling. That actually a ceiling that you can live where you can live and stay in, which was completely innovative. So innovative the walls, innovative the windows. You see here, we, he invented the strip window. So the pillars, the structure is actually uh, behind the main facade wall. And you have a strip window that allow the viewer to see the landscape with no discontinuity. So from this, and then the, the, the material, so it's using reinforced concrete that was just invented in the 19th century, so he wanted to promote the new material compared to William Morris that instead used the typical traditional brick. So from analyzing the elements of these buildings, you can actually understand the change in perspective and how some people believe it was good, some other didn't think it was actually excellent. And another aspect that is that Le Corbusier, for example, see, look at the detail of this house. He designed everything interconnected. So he was an architect, but at the same time, he was taking care of all the design of the house at 360 degrees. In fact, what is extremely different from nowadays, which is particularly fascinating, is that architects before the Second World War were architects that were not just architects, but they were designers, artists, urban planners, writers, and so on. Here you can see a little summary of what Le Corbusier have done. For example, he, in these two images, you can see that he was promoting uh, the minimum space for living. So he had imagined a three meters by three meters home with everything inside. So it is a project of architecture, but inside you find a bedroom, a kitchen, a bathroom, a gym, and so on. So then not just he made this effort of trying to give a house for everyone in line with the whole industrialization and mass production conceptual ideas, but he also made paintings. And then he also designed a chair, so a piece of design. He wrote a book, which is one of the most famous and important books in the whole history of architecture, which is Towards a New Architecture. And then he designed the house with the five principles of architecture, like the ones that I was saying before. So a home, for example, that is not attached to the floor, that is not related to nature, that is using contemporary materials, that is not using traditional shapes and forms of the house, using the ceiling and so on. And finally, he also was an urban planner and he imagined a completely different types of city. I mean, you are very familiar, for example, with Indian villages. 
That is the kind of uh, urbanization that was available before industrialization. So small, tiny roads, organic patterns, very tight and um, and and very um, with high um, high density uh, urban spaces. So what Le Corbusier in the 19th century imagined was something absolutely unprecedented, which is this kind of design. So towers detached from each other, so a texture and a pattern of houses that are not linked together, tall buildings that were definitely not there before, and a whole um, new conceptualization of minimal space uh, that you can see here from the Unité d'Habitation. This kind of tall building had, a, in his mind, had a particular structure. So they were, of course, flat, but in his idea, they had to be self-sufficient. So imagine how innovative he was. This building had to be self-sufficient. So it had in the middle a road with all shops, like the grocery or the bakery, were all within the building. And then on the top floor, there was this, um, let's say this terrace that had, for example, the nursery for the kids so that the people before going to work, they could leave the kids. And this, this kind of city was able to be conceived just because there was the car, because otherwise how the people could go to work from one building to another or from one place to another. So the idea was that people were living in this self-sufficient building, then taking a car and going to work. Completely innovative. So what I want you to uh, think about is that it's just nowadays that we think as architect, artist and designer as something separate from each other. Up till the Second World War, the figures were very much mixed with each other. And definitely Le Corbusier is a very interesting uh, figure. So what happened? So if we go into what we have said, the changes that happened in design were these, that if in the Greek vase was done one in one day, now, as I said, uh, the, um, the vase was done 3,000, for example, in one day, up to 10,000. So this is one of the changes. Then there is the invention of photography, as I said. So in the end of the 18th century, there was already a prototype of a camera. So uh, artists, all the vedutisti uh, artists that are a group of artists that developed, especially in the northern part of Italy, actually, uh, they were using this system. So they were using a sort of prototype of camera that was allowing the light to enter. So the image, if you put um, a, a black, a black box and you put a small uh, hole in it and you let the, the light pass through, the image that is in front of that hole will be projected in this uh, area upside down. So that was how the uh, painters were doing their uh, very realistic uh, painting. So this was the, um, this was the sort of um, effect the kind of paintings were done at the end of the 18th century before photography. But then this prototype of camera then ended up to be a, a camera, a proper camera. So you didn't need the person anymore to do the painting. But in this uh, area over here, there were certain uh, crystals that were able to, be, to have an impression with light and give us the black and white first photographs. So this, again, was an incredible change because certain first kind of photographs were coming up that were not colored photographs as we have nowadays, because this is uh, Alinari, where a group of uh, first photographers that they were making the photographs in black and white and then painting them by hand. So somehow this invention of photography created a huge crisis of art. Because in the, in, in the history of Western architecture, in Indian uh, history of art is slightly different, but the 19th century is a crucial moment when photography was invented and photography somehow replaced the role of art. Up from the Greek and Romans, up till the 19th century, art in, um, in the West was trying to achieve uh, realism. So that was the goal, to be as realistic as possible. So for example, this technique came because realism was a value. So they had to try and find a way to represent, uh, uh, for example, spaces, cities, uh, people in the more realistic way as possible. But when photography was invented, can you imagine the kind of crisis art had? 
because the photographer, the photo was making uh, the work of an artist much better because he could, uh, photography could um, make uh, the image of that particular place or that particular people in a perfect manner compared to the artist. So uh, during this time, there is a shift in the 19th century within art from a realistic kind of painting. In fact, if you go and make a little search of Western art before in the 19th century it was all focused on realistic uh, design. So you can find here, you have an example of uh, a Baroque, this is Caravaggio, uh, that designed uh, a human being. You can see it's extremely realistic. I mean, the proportions are right, the expression of the man is as uh, truthful as possible. You can see all the grapes. I mean, there's nothing uh, unrealistic. But in the 19th century, there is a huge crisis of art. And at that time, a photography had taken the place and the role of art, and art was questioning itself of what we are going to be uh, saying. What can we do if photography is taking our realistic uh, sort of game and goal? So it's from there that from this crisis, from this innovation that art had to change. So it didn't want to be realistic anymore, but it had to turn in expressionism or impressionism. Impressionism is probably one of the most interesting movement of art that developed in the 19th century. So you can see the difference from these two paintings. So one is extremely realistic and the other one, it's yes, depicting a, a bridge, but is absolutely more abstract. I mean, things are like neat. The, uh, the flowers are just dash of colors. So this is more or less the, the effort. So the new painters in the 19th century didn't want to represent art as uh, realistic anymore, but they wanted to represent light and colors. So they wanted to represent an emotion. So they wanted to take a different role from what art had been before. And this is the difference. That's why before, on the left, you can see Domenico Ghirlandaio, a painter from the 15th century that was extremely focusing on realism. And instead, uh, on, the, on your right, you can see Picasso, Pablo Picasso, a painter of the 20th century after the invention of photography. You can see they both represent a woman, but the woman is represented extremely different. So from uh, Domenico Ghirlandaio perspective, the idea was to represent the person as it is, to copy reality. Instead, Pablo Picasso wants to showcase the soul of the woman. So it wants to give an impression of the woman. So probably this woman had uh, big eyes and have very small uh, mouth, or it had this expression of a very uh, playful kind of, of person. So even the choice of color, if we think it is completely misplaced. So this is the kind of shift that also brought us to see the kind of contemporary art that we see nowadays. So many times I, I hear some students saying that, oh, but the art nowadays doesn't have a meaning. Uh, why are people uh, just throwing, there was one student of mine uh, saying, why I have went to the Biennale, I've seen uh, a floor with just onion uh, peel uh, on the floor. So what that, why that is art, why that? I mean, we have reached now to a very creative and a very inclusive kind of art conception because of this 19th century moment. So what we can see is that in the 19th century, there was another shift that you may think of. First of all, the church, uh, the religious institutions were extremely strong. So till the 19th century, art was a tool for um, emperors, power, or religious institution to explain to the common people their vision. So for example, art is very much connected to churches, so we can go and see the, the plates of Jesus Christ, or maybe you can see art connected to public buildings and so on. In the 19th century, there is a very interesting uh, shift. If you think that there was mass production, so an idea of spreading design, art, etc., on a much larger scale, this was also the interest of art of interacting with common people. So for the first time, in this case here, we can see an image of a painting that was done at the end, at the beginning, let's say, of the, of the 19th century, end of 18th century, of a man eating beans. 
I mean, can you imagine? So the shift is in the kind of topics also. So the 19th century is excellent because you move from Jesus Christ. So a Jesus Christ that is now completely realistic because he's lying on the floor with blood and so on. So a maximum peak of realism that then has shifted into a realism and to a different kind of realism, so a different kind of paint that is focusing on uh, people, on people's lives and, and habit and so on. So there is a change of uh, perspective. And even here, if the realism, if, if the religious topics are there, they change completely in their shapes and forms. Because for example, it's not anymore the Jesus Christ as realistic as in this painting of Caravaggio that belongs from the 17th century, but it is a painting like the one of Gauguin. Can you imagine what is weird about it? The Jesus Christ is yellow. <laughs> Can you imagine how strong it is to make Jesus Christ yellow at that time? I mean, it's incredibly um, different from the kind of, uh, representation that we can see before the 19th century. So the whole code, the whole images and perspective of art modifies itself at this time. And then again, we have seen uh, the change in topics and also art had to find its own new, um, new role. So art didn't want to just show reality because for that there was photography already. Art wanted to shock wanted to create a reaction, wanted people to make us think. And in this case, for example, you can see this painted, painting of Monet. What is weird about this painting? The title is uh, Breakfast on the Grass. Can somebody tell me what is very weird about it? It's very weird. Do please notice it. What is strange about it? Breakfast on the Grass. Anyone? Man, the women sitting with the men. Yes. What? What's about? What about that? The men. The man and that. No, no. The women is right, but what is weird about the women? She's not wearing any clothes. Ma'am, she's no, not she's wearing naked. anything. <laughs> She's having breakfast naked. Can you imagine? Imagine we are in the conservative 19th century. And at some point there is somebody who's making a fantastic painting of uh, breakfast on the grass. And there is a woman naked. Very weird. Very, very weird. So somehow art wanted, that's exactly the new purpose of art. Art wanted to shock, to create a reaction which was absolutely not the purpose of art before the 19th century. I'm just showing a few examples for you to have an idea of what is the kind of revolution that happened at that time. Another one, the same Pablo Picasso invented the movement. So from Impressionism, so from that uh, first paintings uh, here, this kind of painting. So a change in stroke, uh, a change in kind of paint because the paint is much more bright, a uh, change that is much more abstract kind of art, a change because uh, they wanted to be uh, less uh, somehow religious and much more provocative. There are a series of movements in art that start coming up. There are very interesting ones. I'm not gonna show them all, but I'm just gonna give you a few examples. For example, there is cubism. Cubism had a particular purpose. It's a movement that wanted to show, um, it criticizes uh, the traditional art because it says that it's only bidimensional. Think about it. The old paintings, even this that I can show you, uh, it's just kind, I mean, this is using perspective, but you can't see the back of the man. So you think it's very limited. So he, this, uh, and even photography was very limited because you could take just a bidimensional photograph. So the effort of Pablo Picasso and of its movement of cubism was to try and show the image at 360 degree. In fact, the um, sort of um, uh, ending paint of it is a man smoking a pipe. So if you look at it carefully, you can recognize the man because you can see the mustache, you can see the pipe, but then you see all this mess. And the mess comes from the effort of the painter of trying to show the man at 360 degree. So you can see part of the back of the hair and you can see one ear here and other elements. So that, for example, was one purpose of one movement. Then you have another, another movement, which was called surrealism. So they didn't want to show reality because we've said it's gone into photography, but surrealist art wanted to show the inner self. 
In fact, at the beginning of the night, during 19th century, Freud and many others have invented psychology. So there was this new world of the interior, the inner self, the inner world. So Magritte, for example, designed this room, showcasing um, the room perceived by a man. It's true, because in, if we get, look, it's just showing the perception of the room from our inner self. If we think of a room, we don't think of a room uh, in an aseptic and objective way. We have some uh, important element. For example, I may have my phone, which is incredibly important. I have to have my laptop, which is incredibly important. And maybe, uh, I don't know, the wall or the television, which is extremely big. I don't care about it. So the effort of Magritte was, I'm not going to show you reality, the real sizes, but I'm going to show you the size according to your feelings of the objects in the room. So for example, if you notice for Magritte, maybe the comb was extremely important because it's huge. And then the glass and then the peel, the peel is huge compared to real uh, dimension. So here is an effort and an example for you to understand that the effort of this artist of going beyond reality and wanted to say something else, something more linked to your uh, inner self, your inner, inner uh, feelings. So this, for example, was another uh, movement of art who was trying to say something different. Then there is another very interesting, to the idea of shocking, of art that need to shock, need to make us think. This is another Dadaism was fantastic. It was coming from Dada, Dada, da, from the kids that, um, that were doing the sound. And the idea of Dadaism was to go back to the kids' ingenuity and the kids' creativeness. So the idea was that kids are so incredible because they can somehow mix things together without a preconception. So we think that a table is to put uh, on, I don't know if we have all things. I mean, you think of a chair and you think that the chair has a particular function and you use the chair just for that function. What the kids does that always make us laugh is that they may take the chair and use the chair for something that is absolutely not thought about. So the same happened with Dadaism. So the effort of these painters and artists was to work with the mentality of the kids, put themselves in a kid mentality and imagine the most strange things. Like this is a present. What is weird about this is that uh, the iron, the iron is done to make clothes smooth and fantastic. And now what he put, he put this needle on top of the, on the, of the, of the, of the iron. So if you think that you're going to iron your beautiful dress with this, uh, with this element, you can imagine what's going to happen to, the, to your clothes. So the idea was precisely that, to create a reaction of shock within the viewer. So that is, again, Dadaism was actually this effort of putting together kids' ideas and, and imprints with uh, this kind of shock effect. So this is another example. There are many, like, for example, fascinating Piero Manzoni, who was, the, I would say, the peak of all of these movement. He imagined the extreme. He put a pedestal, and this is called the magic pedestal, because if whoever would put themselves on top of the pedestal would become a piece of art. So somehow he reached the point to say that everything is art. So that's why nowadays, if you go to the Biennale, you find an onion peel on the floor, they can say that is art because before today, there was this man who actually invented this pedestal and thought that anyone and anything that goes on top of that pedestal can. Entry idea that art was fully linked to realism. In fact, this make usually students laugh very much. He uh, designed these uh, two things. One is artist shit and he had uh, imagined that that uh, can can be sold for a huge amount of mo uh, money and that is a piece of art because of the conception previously we saw that everything can become art so if everything can become art even the artist shit can become art and this is for example another very funny thing it's written in italian but it says it's uh, inside there is an infinite line so he's very provocative. He's creating pieces of art that are completely uh, weird and innovative for that time. Of and he is definitely one of those. 
So what is art for? What is design for? I mean, this is an illustration done by Walter Morino, an Italian, on a journal, a newspaper, entitled Life in 2022. So somehow art is something that is um, incredibly interesting because it makes us uh, make projection for the future, is showing a reality, is actually being a mirror of historical events. So somehow art is not just art. Art is a mirror of something else that has happened in, in the life and history in human life and so on. So this, for example, I mean, if you think of the COVID situation and you look at this painting, you really think uh, deeply of how, how visionary art can be and how uh, art can actually be extremely effective in uh, showcasing a particular situation. So, I mean, I have um, many other things. I mean, I can see that art and design and architecture have always been linked. I mean, if you go to Kajurao and you see how much art there was in the design of the building, and you think at, for example, Cristo and the way he was sort of making, uh, covering up the buildings to make you notice them. So land art is another, another element, another very fascinating um, ground to explore. So art that is connected with, this, uh, with these pieces of, of design and, and make us think, because if you, are, if you walk, he was arguing that you usually walk in a city and you, you get used to it, you don't notice things anymore. So you're thinking, if I'm wrapping up a building, you will notice it again. So it's a very uh, uh, tricky, uh, work that you can find and different lines of connection that you can build up through art, architecture and design. Then there are designs like these fantastic that become part of our daily life. There are these architects who have completely redesigned part of Copenhagen and they have used art and architecture and design together to make the city different. And here you can see the kind he had divided different parts um, and link this design uh, public space, space for people. So here you can see the design of the flooring that he's done for bicycles. So art, design and architecture can make life of people better. That is probably our, our goal. So isn't the real purpose of design and art to make life of people much better. So for example, there are fascinating examples of art, architecture and design, uh, contemporary like the UMA school. They have collected recycled um, bottles taken from the ocean and designed the facade, which is a definitely a piece of design of the school of art, which is beautiful, making this wave to sort of give an idea of the ocean that needs to be protected. Or again, this guy, fantastic, a Kenya-born Kimbele, who designed all his building collecting trash from all of Africa. So he was making this very creative. And again, he made, uh, this is not one of his best designs, but definitely uh, shows the effort of collecting objects, which are objects of design, and turning them into a useful tool. Or the Colossal of Design, which is IKEA, that nowadays is exploring the future of urban living and creating this uh, urban village project. He designed not just the elements of design, just the furniture, but he's designing actually the buildings and everything, imagining to, that every single piece, every single piece of design is recyclable, sustainable, uh, with waste separation, organic composting, and so on. So it's trying to go beyond just the simple design of the object to see it in perspective. And then many other self-sufficient prototype that can produce energy. So thinking of design in an innovative way. So as much as in the 19th century, all these designers have adapted themselves to create a new landscape of art, architecture and design. I believe that nowadays we also have a sort of new mission, new endeavor to sort of try and combine that pollution that nowadays is really an issue, the climate change issues, the renewable energy into beautiful and uh, self-sustainable design. Think of, for example, the forest cities, very incredible idea. Stefano Boeri have thought of a city all made with trees to be able to clean up air self-sufficiently. 
or there are these treescaper community, again, a future of people living in recycled wood and covered in foliage uh, kind of cities. But the most visionary are the skyscraper not built anymore, like in the 19th century, made of uh, concrete and steel, but now thought of bamboo, which is an extremely recyclable material. So a huge amount of example here, very interesting Vietnamese architects who are using bamboo to make splendid designs. Or other people thinking of farm design, like you feed sub-Saharan Africa, they're doing this conceptual skyscrapers where uh, you could uh, make um, uh, hydroponic uh, food uh, that can feed huge amount of people. Of course, it's architecture, but it's also design at the same time. So the things are not, the boundaries between these disciplines are very much connected. And think about the new uh, frontier of uh, analysis that are the one that connects um, uh, nature and the inspiration from nature with design, architecture and art. If you think Leonardo da Vinci, another master of the 15th century, who was copying the, uh, the, um, the, the, the flight and the bird's flight, and they were copying it uh, to design the prototypes of design. And here, this guy who's doing this nowadays, spectacular, sustainable uh, sea animals that move just with wind. So using the wind power to create these monsters. So he have done a huge amount of work in trying to make a piece of art, but is also a piece of engineer, but is also a piece of design. So what is it? So digital era, same process and think process. Amazing. Uh, Theo Jensen is definitely one fascinating guy. And then other example, hydrogen here, ships uh, and ways of flying uh, made with uh, natural and recycled materials. Or oh, this fellow who is copying termites, uh, uh, natural termites houses to make um, uh, buildings like this one, Eastgate Mall in Zimbabwe, to keep the building cool without spending no electricity, no nothing. So. Uh, I've been, I could show you more videos and so on, but I've seen that the time is over. But I hope that this very quick uh, lecture may have inspired you on the many possibilities that are there between arts, architecture, and things that have happened in the past and moment and inspiration that can be taken for the present and the kind of potential that you as designer have uh, for, for the future. So, um, very happy that I've shared these with you. I hope you enjoyed. And if there is anyone who has some questions, I'm happy to answer those. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Buller. I mean, our students are not aware of so much of insights which they can actually grab from art history and the relation of art, evolution of design and the connection, which is very important for them to know. So, uh, opening up the round, uh, question answer round, I think uh, we, many of our students have some of the questions. So, if anyone would like to ask any question, can put down their name in the chat so that I can call out your name and then you can directly interact with Dr. Pillar. Uh, first question which came down uh, was, how can we as user experience designers bring out art history to people, like to bring out awareness about art history? I mean, uh, I mean, awareness is of course, if you know, first the step is to be you yourself aware of art history. Once you are aware of art history, art history is a very broad topic. So there are many aspects of art history that you may want to share with other people. So you, you may then at some point uh, write a book, for example, to share uh, your information. You may want to uh, design a blog to share what you've learned. You may want to design an exhibition to share things with others. I mean, I think once you have conceptualized which are the focus, which are the things that you are interested in, you are going to be able to convey that message to others. So the first step is to know yourself 
which aspect of art history, which aspect of design do you think are interesting? Like, for example, uh, for me, uh, teaching is a way to spread uh, what I've learned, what I'm passionate about with you guys, and something similar you may want to do in the future with other people. So you may want to do public events, you may want to organize art events, you want to uh, maybe uh, do art events and connect art with uh, problems like climate change. So the minute in which you do the connection you may get in touch for example with an entrepreneur or you may get in touch with other stakeholders that may want to finance your kind of art so it depends it, it really depends on which is your goal so the first step is to define which is your goal and then from there you're going to be able then to uh, spread the knowledge and make people aware thank you thank you so much uh, muskan uh, you would like to ask a question can you go ahead uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, hello. Hello, ma'am. Hello. Actually, I wanted to ask, like nowadays, more more and more of people are intimidated and very like into abstract art than compared to realistic art. And yes. how how we can consider like if you know if you're working for someone, if you want to know that what kind of need they want to need, how can we consider that what is better for them? It would be abstract or the realistic one. Why do people always more lend through like abstract art, not more on realistic? I can, I mean, in that sense, I can give my opinion on that. I think a, a realistic or abstract is just a, a, a tool, a way. I mean, of course, a realistic, you have photography. So somehow um, making a realistic paint, if you do have photography, who does it much better than what you would do uh, by hand, of course, uh, the, the realistic art have lost somehow its power. So maybe it's more interesting to have something that is abstract, that may convey a message that is definitely not just copying reality, but is the effort of doing something more. So what I think is not really a question of uh, realistic or abstract, but is an art that is able to make us think. So how do you, how do you conceptualize and how do you think art as something that may change the world, may change people's perspective? So maybe it's a realistic art again that may make uh, people uh, think differently. For example, you may want to make a realistic painting showing how the ocean is polluted nowadays. So you may need realistic photographs to make people think about that. Or sometimes uh, you may need abstract to make some schemes and make people think about, I don't know, maybe traffic. So I think it depends always on the message. So there's not a tool, it's just a tool. But the most important thing is to have the message to say. Once you have the message, you are going to be able to understand which is the better way to share that message. It may be realistic because you want to show how many oceans are polluted by plastic, or it may be abstract because you want to convey the message that most cities are, I don't know, uh, full of traffic and you want to make a diagram showcasing the difference between places and you don't need a realistic photograph. So really, again, it depends on the message. It doesn't depend on the, on the, on the better or less better tool. Oh, thank you, ma'am. No problem. Devaka, sir, uh, you would like to ask a question. Yes. Hi, Dr. Pillar. How are you? Hello. Very good. Hello. Okay. Uh, yeah. So my my question was, and 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 I could, you know I missed the entire session a bit in between, but nevertheless I could catch many of the paintings that you you know kind of uh, you know showcased and and very interesting. Uh, my question, Doctor Pillar, is uh, what does culture mean to you in context to design? And uh, and I want to ask this question primarily because. Uh, in context to you know the young designers who are in front of you, uh, how important it is for them to be to have a keen eye and sense of observations, understanding life around them, and then getting it back into the design elements or whatever they do, whichever area. So, how important is the culture cultural aspect of it? I think uh, culture is uh, everything. I mean, somehow I am, uh, my topic actually is how uh, the, the, the way I teach history of art or architecture or design is always through cultural exchanges. So through cultures, each culture develops a certain particular sensitivity. And as I said, art, architecture and design are a mirror 
of a certain particular culture. So it is very important. It's not that one thing is good or bad, but the cultural awareness uh, make you available to choose. If you do not have cultural awareness, you're not gonna be choose the better solution for a different place and so on. So you may want to open a journal and you may find a certain very inspired things, but if you don't contextualize that particular invention or idea or design into the place where actually that design is gonna be working, you will not be able to get the 360 degree um, uh, best of that design. So every design should be taken into, into context. So, so you may need to adapt it, Maybe you need to adapt it to the climate condition. Maybe you need to adapt it to the cultural condition, maybe to the taste of the people. So if I had to design a home, if I have to design the interior of a home in, for an Italian, for an American or from, for uh, an Indian, probably it's gonna change because certain habits, certain um, choices, tastes are very different. So I think it, everything has to be put in context, both culturally, I mean, in which time and period you are, related to the mission, which kind of mission you have, which kind of message you want to convey. And then that message, where it has to be delivered, is it has to be delivered in one context or the other, change, change it all. But I think if you do uh, something that works very much is to do uh, these analysis in comparison. I mean, if you compare, you may compare and contrast between different uh, places, culture, climates, materials, and so on, that allows really to understand the difference between the potential of the design. Otherwise, you usually, even in, in Italy, was extremely useful for me an experience in India for 10 years in the, in the East, because I grabbed another point of view. So you don't have that bias that always follows us, that we learn from one place and we believe that that is the only way you can look at things. If you are able to compare and contrast with a completely different reality, you realize that it's not that the other reality is worse than yours, it may be better. So there are good and bads from all uh, places. So I think definitely that is the key. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you for the question. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, Dr. Pillar. Uh, Shashank, you have a question. I think you can go ahead. <laughs> Hello, ma'am. Hello. Uh, ma'am, how can art design and architecture help in solving the mental health issues? Like it's a global health concern for the 21st century. So how do you think that an, a particular art piece can help in uh, making us emotional well-being? In, in within architecture, so art in architecture. for all uh, the art or any kind of design, the user experience, architecture, lifestyle, anything. I mean, there is a. I mean, it didn't it didn't work a hundred percent, but uh, during this shift in the nineteenth century, there was a group of uh, those who were um, in favor of modernism. They thought really that art, architecture, and design, especially the Bauhaus, for example, could change and make the life of people better. So they could make it better for people who have health issues, uh, but it could make the life of people better in general. So uh, architecture, art and design had the potential to change uh, the life of people. Of course, this uh, was a little bit of a naive uh, belief because they, they thought that it was absolutely mathematic that if you put that effort to make a good design, you will have a better life for people. And this didn't work 100%. But if you go and look at the studies of the Bauhaus, I honestly think there are many insights that of the mistakes that also have been done in the past in believing that there is a linear uh, consequence. I'm doing this, then this is going to happen. But uh, art, uh, architecture, design do have an impact on people's life. For example, there are certain, I mean, the topic is very broad, but if you look at the studies that have been done, for example, with colors, the kind of colors or the kind of orientation of the houses, I mean, there are uh, things and aspects if you take one by one of design that may uh, give a different feeling, a different sensation, for example, light is definitely proven that light changed the uh, mood of the people. So according to how you put and, uh, and, uh, and design your house with the amount of light that comes in, and if you are, I don't know, putting the house towards the south or not towards the south may affect uh, the, the situation, the mood in which you are in. Or according to the colors that you choose, you may affect the mood of the people. So, I mean, there are or certain um, 
other elements, the kind of design that you choose. So, I mean, there are many studies. If you send me, drop me an email, I'll definitely gonna be able maybe to suggest some books because there are uh, some people, for example, in hospitals, there was Alvaralto, who is a Finnish, very interesting architect who have worked on how the hospital uh, had to work uh, to create a fantastic well-being of people. So the relation, the interaction with nature, the view of the green, the sound, for example, of water that didn't have to have the sound. So he had studied a system on how it had to be clean, extremely peaceful and silent. So, I mean, there are certain things that have been uh, studied to promote this well-being that you're talking about. Alvaralto is one. Le Corbusier also had imagined a fantastic uh, uh, hospital uh, that haven't been realized, but in Venice, where he was actually studying all these um, aspects of well-being. So it's a quite developed um, quite developed discipline that thing that you that you are saying so if you drop me an email i may suggest some books so that you can go slightly deeper thank you ma'am no problem um Bafia, uh, are you there you would like to ask a question yeah you can go ahead yes ma'am good evening ma'am ma'am ma my first question is as we are living in a faster paced growing world with a lot of pollution and many more work which are really harmful for humans as well as the wildlife and faunas, floras, everything. Then how can me as a user designer or any of the people as a designer can help to overcome these problems using some natural things or some natural methods, some natural architecture. For example, you have shown an architect was trying to build a house like uh, the insects build it. They are warm from outside, but uh, like cold from inside, really cool from inside. So they can reduce the use of air conditioners and fans in our homes. Now, how can one make more decisions like that and can make more design designs like that? Reduce human problems and can increase the rate of natural Yes, pain. I mean, there is a field that is now developing, which I'm working on, which is biomimicry. I mean, there is a huge field. I mean, uh, usually digital architecture developed, but it was a little bit harried and has been criticized very much. So now there is a, a group of scholars who have been trying to develop this new branch which is the biomimicry, which is doing exactly what you're saying. They are analyzing nature, thinking that nature is more advanced than us, and that is actually not uh, creating harm to the, to the environment. So by studying what nature does, they're trying to create a healthy and um, very efficient system. So I suggest if you do a little bit of research on biomimicry, you're going to get very inspired for your design, like precisely what you're trying to uh, discover. So they're giving all examples. Ma'am, one more question I have. Yes. Uh, the next question is, ma'am, as you have said, in today's era, ma'am, the art, the realistic art, which was there in the earlier period has now lost its value. Yes. We are moving more towards an abstract art. So ma'am, how can we as a designers can bring the realistic art back to its life make its value back again so that people can understand the value of art as well as photography. Okay, we, we, you have, I have to put uh, in brackets something that is uh, different from the Western art and the Indian art. For example, you had, um, in India, I've been working in a, in a trust that works in different villages around India. So I got in touch with many craft, art and craft and so on. So something that have happened in the West, so this realistic art then changed with photography in the 19th century, become much more abstract, is a, a process that happened very much in the West. But if we had to do another lecture or something else about Indian kind of art, the situation is completely different. Indian art is very much abstract since the beginning, because if you look even at the... Um, uh, all the gods that you have, the Hindu gods and, and all, they are very less realistic. They're much more creative, much more abstract. Even all the crafts that you have, uh, Madhubani or other forms of art, they're not realistic. They are much more abstract from the beginning. And then with the influence of colonization, uh, the Ravivarma, for example, have brought in that kind of realism. So 
uh, why would you want to bring back the realistic? Again, it's always, it goes back to the purpose. Uh, art is just a tool. So it's not about bringing back realism or not. It's about uh, choosing a form of art that is gonna be able to express what you want to say. So if you want to uh, protect the environment and be responsible for the environment, you'll have to decide the mission and then decide the form of art that is the most uh, important for you. For example, if the, uh, your aim and goal is to protect villages, art and craft, that should be the goal. Then you'll find a way to promote those forms of art that are more traditional, more culturally related and so on. So it's never a purpose that I want to bring back uh, realism, because realism is just a tool. Art is always a mirror of, uh, of something else that you want to say. So it's a mirror of society, it's a mirror of a mission, it's a mirror of an ideal. So first, what you want to say, then you decide if realism is the best or not. That is something that has to come afterwards. Okay. So ma'am, can, ma can we consider the Rajasthani Kings, rulers, they have their portraits made. Can we consider them as realistic paintings, realistic arts? I mean, uh, that's not as not, I mean, that is gonna, it has to have a, a little bit of context uh, because of course uh, you, uh, if I just uh, speak about uh, the, the, the I'm not able to put it in, in, in this context because there are, there are some shades and differences between one and the other. But of course, realistic, as I am, have tried to explain it today, is something that really belongs to the Western idea. If we enter into the Indian realm, it changed completely. I mean, for example, you have the Rajasthani kind of miniature paintings, which are part of a cultural influence from the Mughals. And so it changes again. So uh, yes, it is realistic, but it's not uh, as, again, it's not realistic as the Western kind of realism. So again, we'll have to make another sub analysis of what realism is, which kind of shades are there. So. If I have to give a sharp answer, I would say no, it's not that kind of realism. But then again, that is something that we should uh, spend some time to go slightly deeper on it. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank you, thank you, Dr. Pillar. So uh, I think I would take the last question, which is uh, by Mustan. So she is asking that nowadays it's difficult for a particular individual to be a professional in any one stream. How can you compare art and design as a one long run according to you? I mean, as I said, I think uh, the strength is that uh, design and art, they do not go uh, separately. Of course, design has a difference like architecture from art. Pure art is much more difficult as a job because of course it doesn't have the functional aspect. So somehow the design have functionality so it has an additional element that makes uh, uh, the, 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 also the, the need for buying that particular element creates a market that is definitely different from the one of art. Art has a, a much more difficult market compared to the one of design. In design, you have many types of design. You have uh, um, industrial design, you have interior design, you have fashion design, you have so many design. So I would definitely say that if for a professional uh, goal, design is definitely much more broad because you still can teach design, you can speak about art through design. I mean, there are um, I mean, if you do design, you can do art. If you do art, you maybe not be able to do design. So always think in that sense. If you've studied design, you also have studied topics and, um, and certain particular disciplines that with only art, you will not be able to do. Instead, if you do um, only art, you may uh, absolutely not have those elements that, for example, the sense of space or the sense of functionality, that is something with art you're not gonna be able to learn. So if you had to make a choice, I would do design just because it opens up more options, that, just for that reason. But I'm fond of art, as you have seen, so I am a bit. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, I think we can have, uh, group picture all together so that everyone can switch on their cameras and quickly <laughs> Uh, 
while we are waiting for them to switch on the camera, Akshata and Mrs. Shukla, I would uh, really be happy to uh, eventually discuss together if uh, one can uh, do something together in the future. So I'll be very happy to see if one can then, I don't know, maybe do some, some joint collaboration or something between uh, different countries. So I would really be happy about that. So if you... I think uh, they all are like budding artists and budding designers. So they have learned a lot today and then they will come up with certain uh, creative, uh, you know, applications which will help us out uh, in the future. And your uh, all together talk was so inspiring. I think everyone is so glad to know so much about art. So, uh, yeah, can we click? Okay, ready? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Pula, for such an insightful session. And we would love to have you on campus whenever you visit to Delhi and India soon. And we had such a great session, such interesting uh, aspects which you have mentioned today. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you to all. Thank you, Mr. Shukla. Thank you very much, Akshata. Very kind of you of, of organizing this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Patrick. Thank you, ma'am.